But after everybody left, go back through the whole thing and record it. But the first one was kind of like a practice. So the second time through worked okay. Uh, okay, so uh, for this exam, you got two uh, extra credits, right? Remember, naming the compounds and fill out that periodic chart. Okay. Uh, does anybody need a copy that they don't have? Everybody should have a copy already. I have a couple of extras. So if we want to turn that in, we turn it in first. Oh, you can turn it in time. But if, if you want to use it to study, you can keep it until the exam day. Yeah. You need a plug in? Yeah, I think my moves. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Oh yeah, it's gonna be fun back there today at party. All right, so I always start off a review session uh, with a question. Anybody having any burning issues that we need to get to before I start talking? Because I want to be sure and, and cover all of your problems before I just do a general review. Well, it doesn't need a name if you can think of an example. <coughs> Are you drawing from the uh, review document? No, this is just from the uh, file. Okay, that's fine. Uh, okay. It's kind of starting to get the hang of them, but I'm not comfortable with them. Okay. It helped to write them out like that. Writing formulas. Yeah. Okay. We can focus on that first. And that and as long uh, as everybody have a good grasp of symbols, the ones that I gave you on that periodic table. Okay. If you know your symbols, then we can go to the next step, which is writing compounds. Uh, did anybody bother to look at the review document? I handed that one out for this one, didn't I? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to at it. Yeah. I'm going to work on it. I recommend going through it at least once. In here. <laughs> um, and at the back of the review document, there are several pages of information, useful information. Okay. That will appear on the exam. So this stuff you won't have to memorize. Now the, the periodic table that's with this one and this one up here don't have the names, just the symbols. So you need to know what those symbols represent. Uh, but the polyatomic ions, when you start writing compounds that need polyatomic ions, they're going to be given on the test in this document. So you don't have to memorize them. You just need to know what they look like, how to recognize one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so let's start with uh, uh, writing compounds. How about that? So we we'll want to cover that cover that topic with you. That's actually in chapter five, I believe, is when we get into writing compounds. Um, okay, so you've got three types of compounds. Right. Remember that? Type 1, type 2, type 3. Type 1 compounds are uh, metal, non-metal. Okay? And the, the metal ion is a fixed charge. <coughs> so how do you know if it's a fixed charge? Well, there are only a few of them. The alkali metals are plus one charge. Alkaline earths are plus two charge. The boron, aluminum, gallium, they're plus three charge. 
And um, there are a couple in here, like silver and zinc, they're fixed charge. So they technically would fit as a type one. How would you, like, how could you tell the charge? Because you said like the column one is like one charge. Two, uh, plus one. Then when you get to 13. Plus two. Three, right. Plus three. Yeah, about the ones the skip over these. It's like, take this section over here and just cram it over here like this. Or the ones you said in the middle, like the, uh, what were those? These are transition metals. Like what's their fixed charge? Yeah. Um, silver is plus one, zinc is plus two. Okay. And they don't have any other charges. But I don't know if I said in this course, but if you <laughs> If you use the uh, type, the type two convention for all of these metals here and here, I won't object. You can use either the type one or type two for these two. Okay. Um, now your your homework, uh, the owl might be a little more hard-nosed about it. So if you have a compound with silver in it, and you put silver parentheses Roman numeral one, and then say chloride, um, the owl might count it wrong. But on a test, I count it right. Because it uses this convention for the transition metals. <coughs> Just a word of warning. <laughs> so the uh, type twos are also metals, non-metals, but they have variable charge for the metals. Okay. And like I said, that includes um, all the transition metals. <coughs> that also includes these guys down here because they fit right in there, in that crack. That whole list fits right here, that whole list fits right there. So they're, even though these are lanthanides and these are actinides, they fit in with this group as multiple charge. With the difference between the fixed charge and variable charge? Yeah, it is fixed charge. Fixed? Oh, variable charge? Um, it's like iron can be plus two or plus three. Depends on the compound. And that's given to us. Mm -hmm. right. Yes, it's either given to you in the uh, in the form of the compound or in the name. So if you're expected to write the compound itself, it'll be given to you in the name. For instance, um, well, let me put one of these for an example. Uh, sodium is an alkali metal. Chlorine is a halogen. All of these are minus one. These are minus two, these are minus three. Okay. So uh, sodium is a fixed charge, chlorine is fixed charge. And it only takes one of each to balance the charge. Your compound is neutral, so you have to balance the charges. This is plus one, that's minus one. Simplest ratio, one to one. Uh, if we have calcium, it's an alkaline earth, two plus charge. So to balance that charge, you need two of these. Two minuses balances a two plus. That's type one. Type two, for instance, the iron. So if I give you this one, um, iron with chlorine, <coughs> there's no way to tell. Not, not this way, not as given. This is minus one, yes, but what's the charge on iron? Well, it could be a two, it could be a three. So you have to be told. If it's a three, then you need three of those. Okay. If iron is only a two, then you only need two of those. Okay. Then if you name it this way, it's iron, two, chloride. 
okay? And if you're given that name, that tells you unambiguously what the compound should look like. Iron should have a two plus charge with chlorine. So a two plus charge with chlorine means that's minus, oh, this okay. is two. So the one in parentheses is not even here. Gives you a charge. <clears throat> we don't need a Roman numeral for these because they only have one charge. It would be redundant. Two things that are required for in nomenclature. Don't be ambiguous with your names and don't be redundant. Okay. So this is the only way that uh, calcium chloride can be written. That's the only possibility. No other thing, nothing else works. This is the only way that uh, iron two chloride can be written. Uh, another example. How about lead? What this one? Lead four phosphate. First thing is, lead has a plus four charge, right? PB. Okay, it's got a four plus charge. What's phosphate? There's no element up here by that name, is there? It's gotta be a polyatomic. So you look on your chart, you find the phosphate. You write your phosphate in. Phosphates are always fixed charge. That name means only one possible charge and one arrangement of elements in the polyatomic. That's it. And its charge is three minus. Okay? That's why you need to look at that polyatomic chart, get familiar with it. You don't have to memorize it, but you need to be able to find what you're looking for rather quickly. Being under the concept of four, I guess the three minus probably had to look at it out more. What's the question? Like I thought they had to. Like even out. Yeah. I'm not finished. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, the, the polyatomics behave as a single unit, right? So if you need more than one of them, you have to use parentheses. Okay. So how are you going to balance an even with an odd? We go back to a math trick, cross multiply. So we bring the three over here. And the four goes over there. Okay? And check yourself. See if the charge is balanced. Four times three minus balances three times four plus. Okay? So our charges are balanced. And the formula without the charges, that's just for bookkeeping. That's what the formula should look like. PB3, parentheses, PO4, taken four times. Yeah. Yeah. And you should be able to take this one and write that name. In order to do that, first of all, you've got to recognize, is it a type one or a type two? Well, it's lead coming from this place. It's multiple charge possible, right? It can't be type one because we've already established which ones are type one. If it's not the part of that group of type ones, then it has to be a type two. So you got to figure out what's the charge on lead. Well, you know that phosphate is fixed at three minus. So four times three minus is uh, 12 minus. So the total on the cation has to be 12 plus. So that means spread over three, each one has to be four plus. So that's where the four comes from. Then you can write your name. How was phosphate? Uh, I thought phosphate was two minus, right? Mm -mm. No, phosphate, not phosphorus. Phosphate. PO, right? And that's in the PO4. Column 16. Yeah, check your, check your polyatomic list. You don't have one with you? 
I'm, I'm sure I've got extra. No problem. Eight, you skip 18, and it's like one minus 17, 16, two minus. Okay. Anybody else need one? One. That's a list of polytonic. There are two. Oh, okay. You're just looking at it. There are two. <laughs> one column is sorted by name, and one column is sorted by formula. Um, so, so it's not a whole page of. It's a half a page, right? One sorted one way, one sorted the other way. What's the like largest number a charge can be? Hmm. Like when they give it to you, like if it was like lead, blah blah, false paper. Um. Okay. The best way to answer that question is to look at our chart. Right, those don't have charges, but the one I handed out earlier. Here we go. This one with red lines on it. If you look in the upper right hand corner of each one of those little boxes, you see charges. <coughs> and let's see, there's a plus five. Okay. There's a plus seven. Yes, yeah, so like if it's like a five or a seven, like when you cross multiply, are you just like switching the numbers or do you have to find like the like least common? Okay, um, yeah, cross multiplying is the simplest way to get there. And then you check yourself for, uh, is that the simplest whole number ratio? Uh, yeah. In this case, yeah, it is. Because you can't divide three and four by anything that'll reduce them. Yeah. Well, if it was like four and five. If, one was, if this just, was five, yeah. and that was four, yeah. Maybe it's that's it, you're stuck, yeah. <laughs> you're finished. <laughs> <clears throat> on uh, some of the elemental cells, like on the table, like on the right side, there's different numbers. Like yeah. My periodic table, on, like what, what exactly are those? <coughs> those are possible charges. Actually, they have a dual meaning. Um, sometimes they're charges and sometimes they're oxidation states. And we haven't talked about oxidation states yet. So for our purposes at this point, even though you look down that list, say the halogens, you look down that list, fluorine is minus one, that's it. It can't be anything else. But chlorine right below it, uh, the first one is minus one, but it could be plus one, plus three, plus five, plus seven. Yeah, that's what I could figure out. Yeah, those numbers refer uh, to oxidation states. They're not really charges. It's a way of bookkeeping, keeping track of your electrons. So for our purposes now, if it's in this column, you treat it as a minus one. And we'll deal with the other <coughs> numbers later. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The, uh, the left though is the minus two, right? Yes. That's what confused me with the phosphorus on the type two that you found forward. Why wasn't that a two minus? This one? No, the PO. The PO4, because it's a polyatomic, the charge is established. So, my first, that needs to be, you got to look at the list, make sure it's not polyatomic. Right. We go from there. Now, what are some clues for finding polyatomics? If you've got a compound <coughs> that's written like this, if, if it's got a name, if you're given the name, that says that has to be a polyatomic. Because there's no element up there by that name. This can't be anything else but polyatomic. But if you're given the formula, how do you recognize a polyatomic? You put the ITE or ATE? Uh, does it, no, no. Does it usually have like a number beside of it? Here? No, like in the like in the parentheses, like usually like the PO4, like it always comes together. Yeah, if you're just given that formula? Yeah. Not necessarily. Um, I look for clues. One of the clues is you have three or more elements in your compound. Right. One, one of them is oxygen. Yeah. Okay. That's not always the case, but a, a lot of them have oxygen in them. The others you just have to memorize. <laughs>
that ends in like or something. Right. If it's if you're looking at the name, yeah, A T E I T E. Uh, it may be preceded by a hypo or a per, somewhere like that. For instance, did I show you the uh, the chlorate family? I'll do that. Let me get type three up here, and then we'll go to the the polyatomics. Okay, uh, type threes are non with non, non metal and non metal. So that means they both both the cation and the anion positions are filled from in here. Okay. Now, because they both come from the same side of the chart, you don't really have a cation and anion. But we're we're piggybacking on this convention to produce formulas for type threes. So you get things like um, uh, carbon and oxygen, right? Or it could be like that, or it could be like this. You really don't have a cation or an anion. What really determines what you do first? For a type three, yeah, for a type three, in general, the one that uh, uh, is on the left is the one you put first, treat it like a cation. So the second one then is going to be ended with IDE. So this is carbon. All of these are carbon. And then oxygen is how many of them are there? If there's one, it's monoxide, right? You remember the one through 10 Greek prefixes? Mono, di, tri, tetra, so forth. This one has two, so it's di. Oxide. And this one is right. This one's a polyatomic, right? So we it has a special name. So carbonate ion. So if it has like the number like beside it, and also has like a charge with it, is it like best for us to like assume that it would be a polyatomic? That's a good clue. Yeah. If it's got a charge. Yeah, if it's got a charge, then um, I'd look at your polyatomic list. Mm -hmm. Right. Or if you have it in a compound like this. No. There's your polyatomic in that compound. But this follows the acid naming convention. We covered that, didn't we? Okay. Yeah. The Right, if it, it's preceded by a hydrogen, it's an acid. And then it might have like a separate one. Didn't you say like if, it, if you're doing acidic, like usually the first page is saying how it's going to be acidic, there'll be another one. There might be another one over here in the body that's not acidic. But uh, kind of like the rule, like two first you'll get like one. I this is your acidic proton. Be acidic, and then like the rest will be like how many it'll be, I guess. Like I remember you saying something like that. Uh, acetic acid yeah. is an example. Like we'll have one H in the beginning and then like another one later on. It's got like this, uh, yeah, right. something like that. So this is a polyatomic ion, acetate. It's got a minus one charge. And this one has a plus one charge. Now, but it's preceded by this hydrogen, so you name it as an acid. Like on the chart right here, it's got the C2H3, but it don't have the first H. No, that chart only gives you the polyatomic ion. It only names this part. That's the acetate ion. If you convert it to an acid by adding a proton, then it becomes acetic acid. Ates become X. So if this is carbonate, it would become carbonic acid. Okay. 
eights become ics, ites become uses. So without that proton, it's not a city. <coughs> well, without that proton, it's not really a compound. We're just naming the ion. Um, okay, so type one, type two, type three. The type three is you just, you say how many of each one you had, except if the first one is one, you don't say mono. I mean, if you say carbon, there's got to be at least one, right? <clears throat> but if you have more than one, like uh, this one, that would be di nitrogen, right? First of all, how do you know that that one is a type three? Um, N and O together. N's here, O's there. They're both non-metals. So that tells you it's a type three, right? So if you're given a compound, expected to name it, first thing you do is look at the first and the second part. Where do they come from? If they're both non-metals, automatic type three. If one's a metal, then you look for whether it's this kind or that kind, fixed or variable. Then that tells you where you need to be for the naming. So you know, it's your decision tree. So is this the first thing we need to kind of look at? Is this going to be a polycom or anything? Or is it easier to do? Um, no, not necessarily. I follow that decision. Is it a non-metal, non-metal, right? If you've got three or more part, uh, elements in the compound, then you know one of them is probably a polyatomic. So polyatomic can be a two or a three. Two or three what? Right. No, polyatomics can't be a, uh, yeah, that's a mistake. That, that should have been separated out as acid. This is a type three. Acids are no type. Polyatomics yeah. are type threes. Poly <laughs> no, polyatomics are special. Acid is their own. Yes. So that type one, two, three. Poly polyatomics. polyatomics could be here, or they could be here, or they could be acids, okay. but they're not type threes because they have a fixed charge. They, they have a bona fide charge. They don't have a make-believe charge, right? <clears throat> so polyatomics could fit in different places. Um, oh, yeah, I was gonna show you the uh, uh, polyatomics. Sometimes they come in families. If you look at your, let's see. Hold on a second. Everybody else has one of these and you don't. Unless you made a copy off of Blackwood. That's your list of poly. Oh, yeah. Okay. You'll notice that most of the polyatomics have oxygen in them. There are a few that don't have oxygen. Um, this one is the ammonium ion. It's the only positive, positively charged polyatomic in that whole list. That's the only one that's positive, the rest are negative. Okay? Then there's another one that doesn't have oxygen. A cyanide ion. Okay? I'm trying to think if there are any others. Uh, oxygen. Yeah, I'm not going to give you that one, so we won't worry about it. The azide ion. Rest of them have oxygen. This is one you'll encounter a lot, but it does have oxygen. Hydroxide ion. You'll see that one in bases. So if you combine this one with any one of these here or here, Put it in solution, water, aqueous solution, and you get a base. It neutralizes acids, right? Okay, for the others, 
Um, some of them come in families. Um, this one, I start here, chlorine and oxygen. Start with that. That's the chlorate. Polyatomic. Okay? Now, if you take away an oxygen, you get another member of the family. <coughs> That's the chloride. We don't have any more endings for taking away the other oxygen, but you do it. Take away another oxygen, notice the charge stays the same. We're just changing the number of oxygens. Now we're gonna go, we're gonna use the prefix, hypo, which means underneath, like hypodermic, under the skin. So here we have a hypo chloride. It's underneath the chloride. And then one more, we go above the chlorate. Okay, we have to use another prefix. This is perchlorate. So there's a family of chlorine-based oxygen polyatomics. So if you, if you establish yourself in here, this one, ClO3 minus, is chlorate. Then you can fill in the rest of them, if you know the pattern. You can do the same thing for bromine, right? If you substitute bromine instead of chlorine, they're both halogens. Then you have bromate, bromite, just put bromine in here. <coughs> Hypobromite. So is per always or? Per is always above chlorate. I think, I think per is, is only used for the, uh, for this group. Let's see, where is it? Well, no, there, well, yeah, that one has four. Permanganate. So there's another per, and it has four oxygens. I don't know if that's a coincidence or there's some logic to it. Uh, the manganate ion, yes. So it follows the same, I guess. So uh -huh. this rule, this rule. This rule. I know those exist. I'm not sure if this one does, <coughs> but it seems logical. Manganite. I don't know if hypomanganite exists. <laughs> you're, you're stretching my uh, abilities here. <clears throat> but you can do that with uh, bromine, and you can do it with iodine. So you have iodate, iodide, hypoiodide. So with just this pattern, you can fill in uh, 12. 12 different polyatomics that you've got memorized already. All you have to remember is, is this order. Start here, go down two, up one, and then change that one and the name to go with it. So if it's one or two, it's going to be I, and if it's three or four, it's going to be A? On the ending, yes. Uh huh. With prefixes in those two cases. Yep. That's right. Um, let's see. Oh, there's one other per. This one kind of stands by itself. Peroxide. And that one is, uh, I'm making mistakes. That one is O2, 2 minus. That's the peroxide polyatomic. I don't have the same rule with four. I'm sorry? Like how other curves are fours. Yeah, that's different. Just peroxide is special. There's nothing else that goes with peroxide. It stands alone. 
Yep. Okay. So let's see what else, what other trouble we can cause here. Oh, did I cover all your concerns? Is anybody else? Okay. Because I'll, I'll get started on something and digress and we'll run out of time. That was in chapter five, actually. Is there anything in chapter four that's giving you trouble? Like, um, if you're given a, um, like something like this. Let's just say you have that. And I'm telling you that that's the atomic number. Find the symbol. Maybe, uh -huh, that's lead. So in that case, this is the atomic number, and this is what? The mass number, right. And the mass number represents, if this is protons, this is protons plus neutrons, right? Okay? And register the stuff, you got your protons make up a lot more mass than the electrons. Yeah, I think I'll read that. Yes, uh-huh, right. The, the proton and electron have equal and opposite charges, but their masses are wildly different. Neutron almost basically the same as a proton, right? Yes, just a gnat's hair's difference in mass. Right, the electron is like something like uh, <coughs> 1,800 times smaller than a proton. So you subtract 206 from the magnitude to get your... Right, the number of neutrons, so that'd be four, uh, 12, 124 neutrons. What if, let's make some room here, I'm encroaching on space. Remember the four positions around your element, neutrons, mass number, I mean, uh, protons, mass number, numbers of elements, and charge, right? So let's say, we have a two plus charge, right? We've still got the same number of protons, right? Can't change the protons or that changes this. Okay. So how do we get that charge? How do you get the charge <coughs> on an element if you can't touch the protons? Right? We can't add two protons. You lose electrons. Lose electrons, right? It's the balance. So if you've had 82 there, and if you're neutral, you have 82 electrons, right? Okay, so how many electrons do you have? Eight. Now you've got a two plus ion. So what is the two and six for? That's the mass number. A, this is C. The mass number is only this plus neutrons. Right. So it doesn't enter into the charge at all. It's understood if the element is neutral, the protons and electrons are equal. So if you have a charge, you know that you have to adjust that charge by the number of electrons. And the <coughs> top right and bottom right, what is the what? No. The bottom right is the number of the of elements. Say if we have um, naturally occurring oxygen in the atmosphere, right? it's always going to be two. It's one of the diatomics. Remember that the table I gave you. I identify the diatomics as hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, and chromine. All of those are diatomic under normal atmospheric pressure and temperature. <coughs> so you're saying that the diatomic always have that too? They're always that way, yes. Okay. Under their naturally occurring condition. Now you can force them to be a, a monoatomic, right? But it takes extreme conditions to do that. They prefer <laughs> being buddies with one of their neighbors 
in the top right part of the cell is this is charge. charge. Always charge. These are reserved positions around the symbol. Let's make some more room here. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's see, how about, do we got to understand the, I guess, the Dalton's Talent Theory much? Uh, I would recommend it. <laughs> Is that giving you trouble? No, it's just a matter of memorizing. Yeah, there was just a few, there was yeah. a few different ones they talked about. Just pretend you're in the anatomy and physiology and it's, you just have to memorize it. That's the whole thing about A and P. Well, 80%. And then you use what you've memorized to synthesize situations. Um, okay, so let me see. Oh, there's not one in here. Well, maybe I can make one up. <coughs> make up a table. Uh, let's see. So we have the symbol. We have the um, um, number, number of protons, uh, mass number, number of neutrons, number of electrons, and charge. How about that? To my ability to think on the fly. Okay, let me start off with say this one. <coughs> and we're we'll give it a charge. And let's say, um, let's say this one. And I'm going to say the charge is zero. And let's say. about this one and say this. How about that? Let's see, can we fill in the rest of the chart? Let's start with this one. Aluminum. What would this number be? Right. How about this number? Mm -hmm. Same number. <laughs> How about this number? Mm -hmm. That's that's kind of iffy. Do you round up? Well, uh, yeah, that was this was a bad choice. But the most likely number would be twenty-seven. So how many neutrons does that give us? Uh huh. Okay, and the charge? Three plus, right? Okay, how many electrons? Right, okay, so we did it. How about this one? What should the symbol be? Uh-huh. Should it have anything up here? It's always positive to the Anything. <laughs> <laughs> There's a clue. <laughs> oh, okay, this one. Uh -huh. How about that one? Most likely. Probably 65, yeah. 
How about uh, this one? In this case, 35. This one will also be 30 because it's neutral. Hmm? Okay, how about this one? Let's work backwards. If that's 25, that's 25. Right. Well, now we can put the symbol in. Mm -hmm. huh? What is M in it? Manganese. Uh -huh. Everybody watch Caddyshack? Been a while. Been a while. Remember the scene in uh, uh, <coughs> Bill Murray's barn <laughs> where, <laughs> where Chevy Chase was playing through? Okay. He pulled out his manual and he says, I'm going to be uh, Ed Green's keeper in five years. And he says, he starts looking at his manual saying, um, you know, something, something grass. And he says, manganese. People don't know about manganese. Chinch bugs. Manganese. I remember that manganese. You probably didn't have a clue what it was. Uh, okay, so this number would be probably, probably 55. Mm -hmm. Most common. Okay. Uh, so that means this one would be, huh? and how about, let's see, the charge, right. Now let me see if I chose that correctly. Is that one possible? Yeah, plus two is a possible charge. I was testing my memory. Okay. So that's a good check on whether you know what those things are and can you calculate them. I think you did pretty good. I don't want... Question? How do you get the, um, the A? Oh, this is the mass number. So oh, it's, so it's going to be the one at the... Uh, it's going to be this one plus that one. So how oh, how did we get it? Oh, right, because I didn't give them to you. What we were doing was saying, What's the most likely mass number? So we look at this one, which is the atomic mass, the average atomic mass. And we're saying the most likely mass number that would give you that is rounded up. <coughs> this is really close to 75. So it is 75. 75. And so what is the N? Uh, N, N zero, neutrons. So we take the protons and subtract it from A, and we get the neutrons. Now, this one would really give you trouble. Chlorine. 35, 45, which way do you go? Right? As it turns out, uh, chlorine is composed almost equally of uh, mass number 35 and 30, 36. It's strange that way. So we would just have to pick something if it wasn't given to you. <clears throat> okay, doing pretty good on time. Uh, let's see. Let's try this one. Naming acids. Oh, no. Which one of these is named correctly? Let's do it that way. Okay, so this one, this one, and these are aqueous, aqueous. Remember, you don't have an acid unless it's aqueous solution for our purposes. You can have non-aqueous acids, but that's, <coughs> that's an advanced subject. So just assume, <laughs> that it has to be an aqueous solution to be an acid. So if this were not an aqueous solution, what would we call it? Hydrogen chloride, right? It would be a gas. If we dissolve it in water, then it becomes an acid. Right, if there's no oxygen, you start with hydro, don't you? Hydrochloric. Hydrochloric. Let's we'll fill it in. Hydrochloric acid. And we know it's an acid because it starts with hydrogen and it has the 
and it's aqueous. Mm -hmm. So the so what is the aqueous? Aqueous. Aqueous. In, so that dissolved in water. So that would be S. Mm -hmm. That would be an acid. It starts with hydrogen, and we dissolve it in water, makes it an acid. Uh, let me get the rest of them up here. How about this one? And this one. <coughs> okay. So, clue, you got three elements and one of them is oxygen. That's polyatomic, right? So you look it up, you find out it's nitrate, right? So nitrate eights as an acid, eights become X. Mm -hmm. And you don't precede it with hydro because it's got oxygen in it. So you just start with a nitrate and you say nitric acid. So why don't you include the H? You, we don't say hydro because of the oxygen. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's just convention. It's one of those rules you just have to learn. Hmm. How about what is this? That's not an acid. Let's see. It doesn't say, but it should be a gas. This is ammonia. And it's first cousin. Is that right? Ammonium ion. Okay. Now we've got the ammonium ion over here, and it's in the compound. The ammonium ion it can only have one possible charge, right? That's only one possible charge, so we treat it as if it were a type one. What separates those two from the ammonium? The ammonia. Say that again. The ammonium is on the polyatomic list. Yeah, it is on the list. But ammonia, or ammonia. <coughs> no, because it's not an ion. It's a compound, and it has a special name. Right? IUPAC has allowed ammonia as its official name, just like H two O is water. Okay. <coughs> so when we say ammonia, it's automatically this. Can't be anything else. But this is ammonium. And this is what? We did that one earlier. Mm -hmm. Ammonium phosphate. And that's all you have to say. That's unambiguous. Ammonium has a plus one charge, nothing else. Phosphate has a three minus charge, can't be anything else. So when you say ammonium phosphate, you can easily write this compound, ammonium phosphate. We know that this one's plus one, this one's three minus. <coughs> that one has to be three times to balance the charge. No, can't happen. There's a lot of just because rules. <laughs> Ammonia will not combine with phosphate, it's not charged. Put it in water and it becomes charged. <coughs> this is a gas. If you put it in water, all right, I'll, you asked for it. <laughs> we transfer one of these hydrogens over here. That makes it plus charge. And then you're left behind with the minus charge, the OH is <coughs> over. Take one of the hydrogens away that leaves you with an OH. Yeah, that got me right there. Just where you get the okay. switch. <clears throat> so, um, while this is true, that's a very minor part. I mean, it's, it's not ionized that way. In water, it exists like this. And only some of, some of it is like that.
Okay. But um, it's continuously going backwards like that. So if you open a, a crack a bottle uh, of ammonium hydroxide or household ammonia, you're going to smell this because right? there's enough of it and it's very pungent. It doesn't take much to knock you on your can. So when we're doing the cross multiplication and switching out the charges, that's more than polytonics, right? Say that again. Uh, when we're switching out the charges, the cross multiplication is more than polytonics that we're doing. No, you can do that with anything. Okay. If you've got um, even numbers, such as um, magnesium and chlorine. Chlorine is always minus one, right? It's a halogen. Magnesium is an alkaline earth. It's always two plus. So in this case, you only need two of these to balance the charges. Well, technically, you could cross multiply this one too, right? That's one. So you bring one over here and the two over there. Still got one. So yeah, if they don't cancel each other out, it's cross multiplying. Right? The the cross multiplication is most effective when you have an even and odd. Right? With an even odd, you can't just subscript one of them and get what the desired result. You've got to do both. Take practice. Practice, practice, practice. We got one left. Okay, so what is this? What kind of compound is that? Oh, I'll let this out. It's an acid. <laughs> it's an acid. <laughs> right. <clears throat> okay, so it's got oxygen in it, and this is a polyatomic, right? So we need to know the name of that polyatomic, which is sulfite, right? H become X, I's become us. So we don't start with hydro, we just start with this name converted to sulfurous acid. Okay? Step by step, I see. What are you looking at? Acid, acid, acid. No oxygen, start with hydro. Oxygen, no hydro. Oxygen, no hydro. So we look at the anion part, right? Nitrate, H become X, there you go. I become us, there you go. Step by step process. Wait, so why did the, um, it become us? Uh, it, convention. ITE becomes us. Yes. Wow. It's just it. <laughs> but yeah, why, yeah. how do you, how do you know the way to do it? When, well, if it's, if it's an acid first, is it an acid? Right? Yes, it's an acid. Then you go into, it's like a decision tree. You come to this decision, right? Acid, no acid. Acid, okay. So we go over here, use this set. Okay, what do we got? Do we have an eight or an eight? No, it's not an eight, so it's an eight. Okay, it has oxygen in it. So we drop the hydro, we don't say hydro. So we look at, at this part of the acid and that determines the name. Sulfite becomes fuss, sulfurous. So red and sulfus, that didn't sound right. Sulfurous. What's the difference between sulfite and sulfurous? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Well, sulfite is the name of the polyatomic ion. It's nothing by itself. Right? It's not a compound by itself. It doesn't exist by itself. Well, except in aqueous solution. And in aqueous solution, it does. <laughs> does that. It dissociates and produces this polyatomic ion. I don't know if that one's in there. Uh, 
Should be. Yes. Yeah. Hydrogen sulfide ion. <laughs> right. That's hydrogen sulfide. But we don't name we don't base the name on the hydrogen sulfide. We base it on the sulfide. Those are based, those are two conventions. This is the naming convention. This is the actual reaction. <clears throat> okay. Let's see. I want to be sure and get to all the main topics here. So in order to <coughs> do well on this exam, you've got to know your symbols. You got to be able to find the polyatomic and recognize the polyatomic. You got to know type one, type two, type three conventions and how to decide which one's which in naming. Go forwards and backwards. Name the compound, name the compound from its formula or write the formula from its name. Yes. If one slips through and it's not one of those reds, call my attention. Because if you've memorized all the red ones, then you'll know which one's not. And in that case, that was an accident, and I'll tell you what it is. Um, Aside from just pounding on the, the same topic over and over, I don't see anything else that's different except for the things like Dawson's Law. What were some of um, them? See if I can get some ideas here. <coughs> oh, different topics. How about this one? This will take some time in writing, but it's worth the effort. How about, tell me which one of these is incorrect. Anybody know what that is? Ozone. Ozone, right. Okay, ozone is considered a molecule. Um, but not an element. True or false? True. False. <coughs> it is a molecule. That's true. Right? It's got three oxygens hooked together. But it's also an element. Right? There's no other atom in there but oxygen. So it's an element. It's a form of the element oxygen. Right? Oxygen normally occurs as O2. But ozone can be formed at high altitudes by the interaction with ultraviolet light. Or it can be produced, used to be produced in laser printers in copious amounts. So the first laser printers had uh, these special packs in them that would absorb ozone and deactivate it until they, they finally came up with a, a lower energy laser that would not produce ozone. Okay, so that was false because of this part right here. That's the false part. How about this one? Uh, gases behave <coughs> ideally at high temperature and 
low pressure. That's true. Those conditions virtually guarantee that a gas is going to behave ideally. Now, what do we mean by high temperature and low pressure? Well, start with pressure. Relative to what? Relative to a container that's 300 atmospheres, right? So low pressure would be one atmosphere. So most gases behave ideally. Low pressure, and but is that high temperature? High temperature relative to what? Relative to absolute zero. Minus 273C, right? So uh, 25 degrees centigrade is high temperature for a gas, okay? So at atmospheric pressure and room temperature, gases will behave ideally. That's true. How about this one? Uh, let's see, one mole of aluminum <coughs> is equal to the number of uh, aluminum atoms in 26.98 grams of aluminum. That's true. How do you know it's true? Because moles equal to everything, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't mole equal to like the number of anything? A mole that is a number, right? Mm -hmm. But how do you know that one mole of aluminum, the number of atoms, is equal to the number of atoms contained in this much aluminum. Because they're always set. Hmm? Thing throughout the Remember, the periodic table is your friend. Yes. 26.98 grams of aluminum is one mole. Because the mole is A mole is a number. Okay, so this number is the same number of atoms in that mass of aluminum because of this number right here. This is called the molar mass. That's how much a mole of aluminum atoms weigh. Okay, I'm glad we get this one. That's true. Uh, let's see, how about this one? Dalton. Dalton statement. Let's see, all atoms <coughs> of a given element. Identical. Okay. First of all, before I finish that statement, is that true? All atoms of a given element are identical. I think that's what he thought. Yeah, that's what he thought. That's, what, that's what he thought, right? That's one of his premises. Yes. What do we know now? So they're not all identical. They're not all identical. How are they different? So the mass, the mass number, right? So that means the number of neutrons, right? Because if you've got comparing two atoms of the same element, they have to have the same protons. That's a given. But so the only way that they can differ in mass number is the number of neutrons. Okay. Then if we finish this statement, it is uh, no longer accepted. So with that added statement. This is true because we don't accept it anymore. Okay, so only one of those was false. The rest of them are true. Uh, let's see. How are we doing on time? We're doing good. If I can come up with any other brainy questions. How about this one?
Let's see. I'm going to put four statements up in there here, and we're going to decide which ones are true. Okay, first one. <coughs> Models. Are always wrong. Unless... Second one, elements <coughs> such as lead are made tiny particles. Mostly consist of open space. Three, uh, the air you breathe. Oops, I always forget that E is an example. And four, uh, because ammonia always contains always contains the same relative numbers of atoms it always uh, contains 4.6 grams <coughs> nitrogen for every one gram of hydrogen. Okay, we gotta find out which ones are true. Models are always wrong unless they're proved by theory. True or false? <laughs> it's false, right? A theory is proposed as why something happens. And as a consequence, and based upon the theory, you get a model. The theory doesn't prove anything about a model. The model is there to help support the theory. So what should it by improved by? Well, models, if a model's wrong, then the theory's wrong. Right? They're not related in that way. That's the false part. <laughs> <coughs> um, how would you disprove a theory? Experiment. Yeah. Yeah, the theory tells you, gives you information that should lead to the uh, uh, N hypothesis or multiple hypotheses. And then once you have the hypothesis, you can test it. And then if you get enough hypotheses coming out wrong, um, you either disprove the theory and discard it. There are three things you can do, remember? You can throw a theory out, you can modify it, right, with your results, or you can restrict its application. So you say up front, this theory is only good for these circumstances and nothing else. That's like classical physics. Newtonian physics only works under certain circumstances. 
If you get really, really, really small, <coughs> it falls apart. If you get really, really, really big, like uh, neutron stars and black holes, Newtonian physics doesn't work there either. Right? So we restrict its application and we use relativity for the big stuff, <coughs> quantum physics for the little stuff. And uh, Einstein spent the rest of his life after he became famous trying to unify all those theories. He never succeeded, but he figured, he said, I can afford to, I've already established my reputation. I can waste all the time I want now. He says, for the young physicists, you know, they got to produce, so they can't spend their time on this garbage. Okay, so that one's false. How about this one? Elements such as lead are made of tiny particles that mostly consist of open space. I want to say false. I want to say false. Huh? Okay, if it's false, why is it false? Because lead is a solid. <coughs> First of all, does lead consist of tiny particles? Yeah. We call them what? Atoms. Okay, that part's true. How about this one? They mostly consist of open space. They're more solid, right? It's condensed. They do consist of open space. Do they? The nuclear theory says most of the mass is contained in a nucleus of protons and neutrons, and the electrons are out here. And the electrons are virtually massless. It's all open space. So it's true. Okay, air you breathe in is an example of heterogeneous mixture. Okay, prove it. What does heterogeneous mean? Not solid. I know homo is like it's different. No, hetero means different. Oh, okay. <laughs> so maybe you were thinking right, but saying wrong. Maybe. Yeah. Heterogeneous means wherever you look in that mixture, you've got a different composition. Right? It might be 10% uh, oxygen over here and 30% oxygen over here. So something like iron. Well, iron's not a not a mixture. Iron's a pure substance. Water's a pure substance. Aqueous solution is a mixture. Foam was one of the examples. I think that would still be a heterogeneous, right? Uh, foam, probably, yeah. Because it's a mixture of, uh, well, there are different types of foams. It could be a liquid with gas mixed in, like your shave cream. That's a foam. Or it could be a solid foam with, with gas impregnated in the solid. Right? This is false. Air is a heterogeneous, uh, homogeneous mixture. No matter where you look, you've always got 20% oxygen, 79% nitrogen, 1% argon. I think I'm starting to feel like everything I'm just going to get the opposite of what I'm thinking. You have to know your definition. <laughs> The definition tells you the answer. If you don't know the difference between homo and hetero, you'll get it wrong. I thought air was hetero. I think of gauge regulation. That's exactly what I was thinking. No. Sorry. That's exactly what I was thinking. That's the only way. That's not the first thing that the gay community has screwed up. Like, <laughs> like co opting the word gay, which means happy. Yeah. Right? Okay, so forget all that stuff. That's sociology. This is chemistry. Hetero means other. So that section over there is other than this one, and it's a different composition. Yeah, homo is that section over there is exactly like that section over there. There's another, uh, the other name for homogeneous. I just want to think that yeah, well, there was hetero. I mean, there's going to be this time where I want to be perfectly distributed, right? Well, you can believe that if you want, but it's going to cost you. <laughs> yeah. How about this one? Ammonia always contains the same relative number of atoms. That's true, right? Yes. One nitrogen, three hydrogens. 
Um, and, and it's always, uh, but because ammonia always contains the same number of relative atoms, it always contains 4.6 grams of nitrogen for every one gram of hydrogen. Well, let's see if that's true. What would be the total mass of ammonia, of one mole of ammonia? You take 14.01 for nitrogen, and then three times 1.01 .01 for oxygen, and that gives you uh, 17.04 grams per mole. Okay, so that's the total. Now, how much of that is nitrogen? Well, the ratio, actually, the ratio is what we're interested in. What's the ratio of nitrogen to hydrogen? So that would be 14.01 ratio to 3.03, .03, right? right? So if we reduce this to one, then we divide that one by three, and let's see if that's right. 18, 12 is close. I would tend to say that's true. But um, that brings up the other topic, a, a, a good rule. When you're, taking, when you're taking a multiple choice test, have, has the school uh, offered any direction on how to take tests? Do they give students any? No, they don't do that. Like Student Success Center? Um, when you yeah. take, okay. Well, what do they say about taking a multiple choice test? <laughs> okay. Yeah, if you're clueless, just pick C, right? Like, uh, dang, I'm just trying to learn, but I'm not. Eliminate. Yeah, eliminate. Yeah, okay. Here's another one. If you're presented with four or five answers and the problem requires you to do a calculation, right, and your calculation comes out, and it's not exactly like any one of the answers. What do you do? Pick the best one. What's the closest to your answer? So always pick the best answer. It may not be, you may not think it's the right answer, but the best answer is usually the correct one. Are we out of time? Oh, I'm still going. I'm going to early. Oh, we got some that forty. Good. Okay. Like that. The second part, the element such as later. Say again. Like the second one, the element such as later, and tiny particles. But it's like you think it lands when we saw it. But the nucleus takes up less space than the. Right. Who proved that? I remember say Rutherford. Rutherford did it. That's right. Ernst Rutherford proved that with his gold foil experiment. Yep. You, heard, you must have heard that somewhere before. <laughs> Let's see if we can stump the band again. Now you got that one down, Pat. It's no big deal. Let's look at definitions for a second. Um, it's kind of a takeoff from that ozone question. What is an element? Right. Uh huh. It's it's the um, yeah. it's the ultimate purification of a substance. Yes. Right. So what is it represented by? <coughs> it's represented by a symbol or a combination of symbols that are only one kind of symbol. Right? So you can have um, uh, carbon, like that. Or you could have a uh, uh, diamond, which is infinite number of carbons together, like right, in a network. 
or you could have a, a buckyball, which is 60 carbons together, right? Buckyball. Bucky it's well, the full name is Buckminster Fullerene. And it, it's like, have, have you ever seen pictures of the uh, uh, Epcot Center, the dome, the dome there? Yeah, that big dome. So if you imagine that as 60 carbons hooked together in a ball, that would be a buckyball. Uh, nanotubes, well, this is diamond, but nanotubes will also be So you've got carbon and nothing else. That's an element. These are called allotropes, right? different allotropes. This could be um, uh, graphite. It's actually like this taken numerous times. So you only have one symbol in an element. So examples are diatomics or ozone. <coughs> Or phosphorus. But no, these are all still examples of elements. They're still elements, exactly. Yeah. Now, yeah. You say something like the, a lot of them, I think it was the metals, it's not, because they're so reactive, they're not really found in nature. There's something. You can uh, yes. Um, almost all of the metals are found in compounds. Now, to be a compound, you've got to have two or more different elements, right? So these are not compounds. They're molecules. These are definitely molecules. That is, they're associations of elements that behave as one. But molecules can also be compounds. such as water, that's a compound. You've got two elements in combination and they behave as a single unit. So they're also <coughs> molecules, right? So you can have molecules as compounds or elements. Um, carbon dioxide is a molecule. Um, Compounds can be more than one element, such as uh, seeing that one in A and P. What is that? That's <coughs> glucose. Okay. Well, it may not be glucose. It's a hexose. Right. Glucose has a specific structure. But for our argument's sake, we're going to call that glucose. <clears throat> or it could be uh, table sugar. See if, see if I can do this. Um, see, I'm getting confused like how the, the CHO that you got up there, and then I'm looking on the polyatomic thing, and then I see a benzo, benz, benzoate. Basically, same thing. Yeah, my, my memory is failing me. <coughs> Skip that. <laughs> <laughs> Say again. Okay. Like, oh, did you find another polyatomic? Like, thing? every, you just change the number and they're completely different. Yeah. That's, that's, I can't remember that. I know that's why we got on the list, but. Uh, the, the formula determines the compound for now. Later we'll find that the formula and the structure determines the compound. Because you can have that formula and different structures. Like it could be glucose, it could be fructose, it could be galactose, it could be lactose, you know, milk sugar. No, lactose is, excuse me, that's wrong. That wouldn't, couldn't be lactose. Lactose is a disaccharide. It's like sucrose. But there are a whole host of these hexoses that have different structures of the exact same formula.
<coughs> okay. Elements, molecules, <coughs> compounds. Covered that. I gotta fix this. Take away a water. H two. So that's six, twelve, eleven. Hydrogen. Twenty four. Take away two. That's twenty two. There you go. That's sucrose. Yeah, I know. I do it. Well, that's the molecular formula for sucrose. But like I said, it, it could be any disaccharide. Because ozone is usually sugar. Stuff, yes. Yeah. Uh, lactose is a disaccharide that some people can't digest. Stuff like that makes sense, but there's just like a lot of rules. It's just because that's I can't write my head. Yeah. Um, right. That's because science evolves. In other words, it's gradually built and adds on things. And occasionally, we step back and say, all right, we need to fix this before we go any farther. Right. So naming compounds was one of those uh, aha moments. So we had um, <coughs> this one, uh, versus this one, right? Now we name that. Uh, iron 2 chloride or iron 3 chloride, but it used to be ferrous chloride and ferric chloride. But that us and ick ending can be applied to other compounds. Uh, and when it is, they may not be the same charge. Right. You just have to memorize what it is. So I said, wait a minute, we, we got to do away with that. So they got rid of this and came up with that convention where you just say iron two. That fixes the whole thing. Because now you're specific. That's the charge, nothing else. So if we use something else like, um, uh, what, Stannis chloride, Stuff they put in your toothpaste. No, not chloride. Fluoride. You want to get fluorine into your toothpaste, you know, to help strengthen your teeth. So they put it in as stannous fluoride. Well, stannous fluoride is uh, 10 <coughs> in fluorine, but this is, uh, duh. there. That's a two plus charge. Coincidence, that's two plus, this is two plus. But um, stannic chloride would be a four plus. See, so this one's three, but that one's four. They got the same ending. It's, it was a mess. So we had to fix it. And then you carry on until you reach another uh, decision point. <laughs> you make another change. Try to fix things. Um, well, I'm a lot of ideas. <laughs> Same thing. God, I thought this guy never, never shut up. I wish I would have had this approach.